Well, good morning, Jeanette, and uh, welcome, a long-standing member of the CYC, uh, a life member of the CYC. What are your early memories here? Of course, your late father, Merv Davey, was a Commodore and a well-known member here. Tell us about the early days and your growing up here, because I guess as a young girl you did grow up here. It was before the clubhouse that uh, I, I was involved, and uh, when Tradewinds was launched in 1943, uh, we did quite a bit of ocean sailing with the other clubs, uh, the Alfreds and the Squadron, and uh, there weren't many yachts that raced because it was the war. So we, uh, uh, it was generally Dad sort of rushing around on the deck and me steering the boat with this huge tiller and with a barn door for a, a rudder, and. Uh, We'd go racing up to up to Pitwater, and uh, it was Mum and Dad and my sister Morna and the dog and probably a cat. And uh, the cat didn't get sick, but the dog did. But uh, it was it was it was great. And of course, we we uh, came across people like Peter Luke and and Charlie Cooper, uh, who were stalwarts of the early club. Uh, I mean, Peter was the person who said to Dad, we were racing in a pit water regatta. And uh, said to Dad, you know, we're starting a cruising yacht club. Uh, the meeting's in my father's studio in, in Castle Race Street, come along. So he did. And that was, uh, I can remember it well because we, we sort of had a sort of a spinnaker thing up. In those days, you had whatever you could put on a boat because it was wartime, uh, or just the war had just finished. And uh, yeah, so that was that. And my early recollections were things like the wonderful meetings that we had with very interesting speakers, such as uh, people like Ellingworth, who uh, uh, it was his suggestion that they race to Hobart instead of cruise. And uh, there was Cariad, which was a South African, uh, big South African catch. Catch? Yes. And they had arrived, they were the first yacht to cruise the world after, mm. after the war. And they arrived and we hosted them. And we took them up to Sverryberg's uh, place up at the basin and all, they saw kangaroos and all that sort of thing. So it, it was a very interesting time. And then uh, Rush Cutter Yacht Service came up for sale and uh, Dad and a few of, the, few of them put their money where their mouth was. Uh, people like um, the old Colonel Southfield, Gordon Ingate's father-in-law. And uh, we bought the Rush Cutter Yacht Service and it was boat shed uh, uh, with a few boats and, and uh, no pontoons or anything, just steps and a wharf and slipway up in the shed. And uh, from there we, we had uh, David, uh, um, what's his name, the architect, he, he decided that we needed a bigger room and of course he had to make sure that the whole thing wouldn't fall down if we took all the walls out. And he did that, and uh, we had a, uh, a masonite dance floor up one end, up this end actually, probably where I'm, where I'm sitting, and the, uh, the bar was the kitchen, and it was a voluntary sort of thing. You were on a roster for the bar, and uh, there was, I think later on, there was a poker machine but I, I think it was privately owned. I don't think there was anybody <laughs> servicing it. And it was a, one of these things that had a handle and you could actually manipulate it a bit to, to get something out of it. But there were a lot of us who were, uh, that was in 1952 or 51, 51 or 52. And there were a lot of us who were young. Uh, uh, I mean, I was only, I don't need, yeah. Well, it's 52. Yes, that was when uh, it was, I think it might have been a bit before that. 
51 we might have bought it because Dad was Commodore and uh, it was when Sverry Berg took over that we actually had all these renovations and things done and his wife Turi and Mum and uh, Reg Campbell's wife and, and uh, so on were all involved and of course we, they, they all had uh, fairly young children, or not that young but teenagers maybe and we, we've sort of we're like a younger set yeah. and uh, uh, I think Mick came back from overseas he'd been at sea well, having, we'll talk about Mick in a moment yeah. come, that's another yeah. subject your husband yeah. Mick but, uh, yeah. Yeah. but just, if I just take you back a couple of years your dad Merv who was you know, a real founding father and a real um, instigator in the success of the club and ocean racing in Australia he won the 49 Hobart race with trade wins that you referred to earlier have you any memories of that race and him winning that was that a must have been a highlight for, for the family <laughs> it was um, more than a highlight <laughs> my mother had kept in her glory box since 1939 she had a whole lot of japara that was kept there so the moths or whatever you eat japara wouldn't eat it and uh, Dad decided we would make a Genoa and a Spinnaker. Now, we meaning me on my mother's treadle sewing machine. So Dad being the engineer and the designer who designed his boat to start with, uh, we went off up you know, to the tennis. We, we cut all this material out and I sewed it, sewed it all up into little strips and uh, then we went up to the tennis court to lay it out and we laid it out on the tennis court and dad got his, his uh, chalk or whatever he had and decided that that was the way it should go and so we cut, it, cut the, the scraggly bits off and joined them up and that was the Genoa, the brand new Japara Genoa and the brand new Spinnaker. And, uh, and of course all the crew had to come and Christmas was a terrible thing at, at home because everybody was, he went to Hobart all the time, we always had the crew and we always had sails and we always had bits and pieces all over the place and the Christmas tree was in a bit of a mess. And, and we had all the, all the crew sitting on the piano stool which was a great long thing because my mother was a great pianist and she liked to you know, really slide up and down the piano and bang at it. And they used to sit there and put the luff ropes on and so all the, all the, all the slides and, and clips and things. And uh, it was uh, a very interesting time. The crew were a great, great team. And uh, they'd, uh, they'd sailed together with Dad. Uh, and a lot of them were... were uh, I, I remember Ian, Ian Toll in the 40s, uh, yeah, in 1946, Ian Toll um, his father was Vic Toll of Toll, uh, uh, what do you call him? Transport. Transport. Yeah. 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 He, he had a boat named Mavic, which was named after he and his wife, Ma Ma uh, Ma uh, yeah, Mavic, Mary and Vic. And he later on, on built Ruthie and named yeah. after Ruth and Ian, his mm. daughter and son. And he came down to inspect the boat and to interview Dad to make sure he was the right person that, for his son to go to Hobart with. Right. Now, now, Ian had been to sea, I mean, it was just after the war, and I mean, it, well, he wasn't a young boy. And uh, anyway, yeah, but Ian met his wife, his wife down there at, 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 uh, in Hobart, that was in the 40s. Yeah. But the 50s, yes, it was really interesting. Yeah, but just, just going back to trade wins before we finish there, that mm. your dad Designed it, built it. Had it built. He had, had it, it built by Walters and Sons. But he would have overseen the oh, construction. Oh, the boiler maker. Yes, yeah, yeah. she didn't have. She was. Uh, she was the first steel yacht, yacht built uh, in Sydney. Uh, there had been another one built over in Western Australia. Right. Uh, but uh, she was not uh, carvel uh, like like um, Travis Carvel yeah. built. 
and of course had a lot of filling in it and they even did the interior and steel so she must have weighed a lot. Yeah. And then he, and you made the sails as you said. Uh, well, yeah, and then I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think he was Commodore in 49 when you won the Hobart race. I think yes. That's, yeah. Yes. He was the first, he's the first Commodore. Yeah. There's only been two Commodores. The second one is uh, Bob Crichton. Yes, that's right. Mm. 1970. Yeah, mm. tremendous mm. achievement. Mm. So then we move on and then... Um, um, well, first of all, he was also the official measurer. Yeah. And uh, in those days there were no calculators and he, being the, the magnificent mathematician he was, he did the whole thing on his slide reel and uh, he had a terrible time when they started bringing international yachts here because they didn't uh, rate to the, to the same rule mm. and he had to remeasure and all this, uh, so he, uh, he called in Alan Payne, <laughs> so he and Alan had the, had the uh, enviable, env enviable job of, of, uh, of uh, doing the measuring, yeah. but uh, after that he and uh, Bob Blumenstock of the New York Yacht mm -hmm. Club and uh, Olin Stevens and the RRC all got together to put together the international mm -hmm. rule mm -hmm. and uh, I've still, one of the few things that I've got is his blazer of some international yachting thing. There wasn't much left after he died, and uh, that yeah. was, took, took my, my sister and I three years to get anything, so yes. it was a bit sad. Yes. But uh, yes, uh, all the wonderful records that he must have had. Yes. Uh, well, I know Alan Stevens refers to him very generously in his, you know, appraisal of rural development and what, what a, racing. Mm. Yes. Mm. What a brilliant young man he. he uh, Oh, yeah, yeah. somebody. <laughs> wonderful, no, wonderful yes. legacy for you yeah. and your family and the club. Yeah. So, and then we go into the 50s, but you used to race, you used to sail passage races and things uh, like that to pit water and... Oh yes, yeah, yes, yeah. and uh, yes, uh, and then in, in, um, in the 40s I, I went in my first ocean race, which was, I mean, overnight race that was, and that was in the Bird Island race, mm -hmm. and of course in those days you'd sort of and everything was black on the on the shoreline. Yeah. And, you know, there weren't many people living <laughs> living up and down the coast. And to actually get up to Bird Island in the dark and be listening for waves <laughs> and and looking for looking something. for something <laughs> that's a black black rock yeah. uh, was really very interesting. Yeah. I did another Bird Island many years later with Ferry Berg. Same thing. Yes. <laughs> and it was yeah. on horizon. But uh, no, that was when I was about 14, I think, and that yeah. was the photograph in the book yes. uh, of all the, a lot of the early members of the club up at the live says It was the King's Birthday Cup. We won it. And coming home from that, uh, Janice Hurst, who came up to sail with us, um, she she ended up sailing doing doing quite a few races with us, ocean racing, and Janice and I were the only girls who were racing uh, on a regular basis, and uh, she came up to come down with us, and Boy Messenger was up there with with uh, Independence, yes. and he had nobody to go home <laughs> with him, so Janice went home with him. And from Independence, they took a photograph of trade winds actually completely out of the water, the whole hull out of really? the water. The seas were absolutely horrendous. Wow. And for Boy and Jan in Independence, they must have been underwater most of the time. Yeah. <laughs> and it was, uh, it, was, it was a very interesting weekend. Yeah. Mick will tell you it's the Oyster Weekend, if you ever come across that. I mean, that photograph yes. I showed you. Yes. Yeah. Is, uh, it was the Oyster Weekend on Mistral 2. He yeah. was there on Mistral yeah. 2. Now the so in the early days the ladies committee or the ladies auxiliary that was uh, formed and no 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 no, no, the, that, no when that, did that come along or? that was Bill Saltis right Mick was rear commodore and um, uh, Bill Saltis was commodore and Ron Cotty was uh, the vice commodore and in September 1963. Bill had decided that, it, and the committee had decided that it would be a very good idea to have a, a ladies' auxiliary. And so 
being the flag officers' wives, who were all members of the associates, they were all, all associate members yeah. rather, they were called to uh, put a meeting together. So we had Ruth Hill, Molly Kaufman, uh, and uh, Betty Hamer, who was the, the secretary here. She was our secretary, and she, she later became uh, Betty Finlay. And uh, we held functions on days that the club was not used for other things to, to get the club used. And at that stage, we had already built the new club. The wooden structure had disappeared. Well, part of it had anyway. And the main room was uh, at the uh, north uh, eastern end. And uh, it, it was called the Blue Water Room. And this is where we held our functions. We had um, Lee Daly organised uh, the Wool Award fashion parades, we had Percy Marks, we had uh, uh, the, f um, the furs, Bibers was it? Biber mm -hmm. furs and uh, we had had the Wool Awards after they, they'd they been in Melbourne. Mm -hmm. uh, we had them every year or most years and uh, we presided over these very elegant luncheons. Uh, I had a small child at the foundation of the committee and he was about six months old. He's now 47. And he was also my third child and he had to be on any committee that I was on. <laughs> so he got used to gourmet food and that sort of thing and became very interested in eating these, this different food that other children never touched. <laughs> Uh, but uh, no, it, it was a very, very interesting time. We had uh, um, a lot of, um, we used to have, have morning teas with uh, travel, different travel things. Lee, Lee had uh, all these uh, um, uh, people that she could pull in uh, to, to give us an interesting, an interesting evening or an interesting afternoon or morning. And it just was keeping the keeping the club going, whilst uh, you know between the races at the weekends. Yeah, yeah. So it was very good, and I used to race ladies' days, and we had things, you know, all those sort of things. Yes. Yeah. Hmm. Now um, you referred to Mick, and that's your husband, Mick York, yeah. who's yeah. one of Australia's most famous yachtsmen. He was the first in our first America's Cup Challenge in 62, first yes. Admiral's Cup Challenge in 65. Yes. You met Mick obviously, or not obviously, but through sailing and, yes. and the, the blossom from there is still blossoming? Well, mm, yes. Uh, he, uh, as I said, he was, he was, thought it was a, you know, a bit strange for a girl with plaits and so <laughs> forth to be in an ocean race and, and uh, so forth. But the, uh, but the, uh, um, I was introduced to him soon after he came back from England after being at sea. He'd been at sea with Shaw Savile for a few years after, after the war because during the war he was on Cockatoo Island and as, as a marine, um, well, fitter and turnum engineer, he was not allowed to leave the island because it was a war effort and they couldn't mm. leave, he couldn't mm. go to sea. Mm. So he joined Shaw Savile and then uh, after that he, ca he came back and he came to a meeting and Hal Evans introduced me and said, I'd like you to meet this famous ocean racing yachtsman. And I said, and what sort of yacht do you sail? And he said, uh, a six metre. <laughs> and I sort of thought, well, no, that doesn't sound like ocean racing <laughs> to me. But it, it was a while um, before uh, he had other interests, and it was a while before he even noticed, I think. Uh, I think it was a, probably a, a Bird Island race I did with Sferi Berg, I think it was. And we still had, we still had the rendezvous up at the basin 
even though we had the clubhouse. And uh, it was there that I think he noticed me. Uh, I think we were on board Loriana because she was a mothership. And anywhere we went in those days, we had her as a mothership because uh, there was you know, no clubhouse uh, in the vicinity. So, uh, yes, no, that's when it was. Mm. Jeanette, tell us about, over the years, some of the characters that you've, you've met and come across at the, at the CYC. I mean, there's, there's a, a few that must stand out, I'm sure. Ah, well, it was before, it, the first one that stands out and still does uh, is Terry Hammond. Now, Terry Hammond was a New Zealand boy and he uh, heard that Ilex was coming over for the 1947 Hobart race and he, they wanted a navigator. Now Terry at that stage was a radio ham, has a brilliant mind, and decided that it shouldn't be too hard to read up about it and learn how to do it. And Australia was pretty big to miss. So <laughs> Ilex arrived over here and uh, in those days our boats were all moored at Rose Bay and places like that. Tradewinds was at Rose Bay, Ilex was more not far from us, and Sir Claude Ploughman had asked us all to go up there to his home, up at uh, Point, oh, was point, it point, 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 point Piper, right. and we went up there to Point Piper for drinks afterwards, and of course we all had wet seats, because in those days you had a dinghy you had to go ashore in, if the tender didn't take you in, you sort of got wet on the BDM, and of course uh, Mrs. Ploughman, in those days he wasn't Sir Claude. And uh, there we had this uh, rather interesting afternoon, drinks or tea or something, and Terry, age 17, and I must have been quite a bit younger, 40, 1947, and uh, by the time he got here, he did know how to navigate. He became one of Australia's, or Australia's most famous uh, international navigators, I think, behind Bill Fesk mm. or with Bill Fesk. Mm. And Terry, to this day, is exactly the same. He, um, he, he gave up doing his, uh, his medical course in Dunedin uh, and decided he'd finish it off here and then everything, sort of, you too many yachts going interesting places. So he was asked to sail Koongoola up to the Mediterranean for the, for the um, coronation of the Queen. And uh, he, uh, Koongoola had uh, the Southern Cross diesel engines he was building. And he wanted Terry to be the, the factory manager or, or whatever. And so Terry, who'd never done engineering, put on a white coat, walked around with a clipboard and just learned how to do it. <laughs> and then he, all through his life, this is what he's done. Yeah. And uh, uh, now, even, even at, uh, I think he must be over 80 now, he, uh, he travels around the world sailing with friends who've got these lovely yachts yeah. and so on. And in a transatlantic race, they had a transatlantic race whereby you have to calculate when you're going to finish mm -hmm. uh, uh, to the minute virtually mm -hmm. and also there was one where you had to make your own sextant and he made one out of a ruler a piece of film from uh, the end of a film you know the black bit and a piece of string and so forth and that was his sextant and he won both prizes yeah. <laughs> which is not to us it's not amazing because anything he puts his mind yes. to he can do yes. and he's still doing this. Yes. 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 Well, I think he, uh, he was asked at the last minute to navigate Solvig I think when they won in 54. Yes. Neither Trig or Magnus yes. Allison could go. I think Stan Skippert and Terry yeah. Terry was the navigator. Yeah. 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 Terrific and he's still great friends with the Halvers. Yes indeed. Yes. And he uh, became the navigator of um, of Gretel in 62 yeah. in the America's Cup yeah. Yeah. and of course the Americans uh, 
had a, they really made quite a turn because the navigation of Gretel was so good mm. that they thought that they had an electronic device that was doing it. And of course, it, it was wasn't, terrible. it was Terry. So, no, he, he, he's really something else. Now, he was, he was the first one. Mm. Then you get, um, who would you get? Boy, Boy Messenger, yes. who forever called me, what did he call me? <laughs> I used to call him Canary Legs. And he called me Butch. <laughs> and he used to wear these, what we call Bombay bloomers. They were shorts, but they were long. And they had great wide legs on them. And they had great wide band around the waist with about five straps on them. And you could pull it into any size that you were on these straps. So he had, and of course they did. They looked, and of course his little pin legs yeah. sticking out the bottom. Yeah, so Boy Messenger, yeah, okay. he and his ferry and the, yeah. with the piano on it, yeah. used to be our barbecues, the, the Black Rock barbecues that uh, used to take the kegs and if, if it was a raining thing, we'd all be on there with Mum playing the piano <laughs> and uh, my sister playing the piano accordion, or Billy Life, say, playing the piano accordion. And uh, so, yes, Boy Messenger would be one. Yeah. Um, Vic Meyer was another. <laughs> Vic... Uh, Vic had, after Siesta was burnt, he bought Loriana and he decided that Loriana's masts weren't tall enough. So he had Alan Payne design these new masts and then of course he got sails to go on them. <laughs> He'd never sailed. Mm. So he said to me one day, he said, Jeanette, would you come out with me and show me how to do this before the experts get at me? And I said, okay. So I went up. I went there and he said, we'll sail up to Bogan Bay uh, on Saturday, and whatever it was. So there was his Peter, Peter, his little son, who, yeah, yes, uh, <laughs> we won't say anything about him. And uh, um, what was his, and his friends, no, uh, she was with us. And the, the four of us were there. So, and uh, we left here not a breath of wind. So we get out off the, off the point here, we have the sails up, and the boat doesn't move. Now Vic is so frustrated, he could not believe it was taking us hours to get to Sydney Heads. And we eventually drifted to the Heads, I think the tide might have taken us. We got to the Heads and a nice little easterly comes up. So the sails are sort of setting, yeah. and, and you know it's fairly flat sea as well. So we put Peter, little Peter, on the wheel, and uh, we're we're sort of off Manly or Dewey, and he is so frustrated he pushes the button, and off we go, roaring up to Palm Beach. And Mick was to come and get me, and of course Mick said to him, he said, "Oh, she's not here." Mick was a bit upset, he didn't quite know what to do. And I said, you're a terrible thing. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so Vic, Vic's first sail in Loriana was with me, but we didn't have much chance to sail. Yes. But uh, he, he got the sails up and that sort of thing, yeah. yes. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, you mentioned the Halversons, I mean, you know, the Sydney Hobart race and this club, I mean, you know, it's hard to mention without mentioning the Halversons, they must have been fantastic. Yeah. Sailors, you know, yeah, so the obvious. But. Well, I remember Magnus, because uh, Magnus still is yeah. a big brute. Yeah. Uh, he's uh, he's over ninety now. He's ninety two or three. Because we went to we went to Carl's ninety ninth birthday the other day, wow. and he was there. And Trig, uh, Trig, I think is almost ninety. Yes. Noreen is his wife is yeah. is also she's a year older. Right. But uh, yes, and but this Oyster Weekend, uh, Magnus picked up the keg, put it on his shoulder, yeah. and walked up the up the mountainside with it on a his shoulder. A full keg. A full yeah, keg, yeah, yeah, and right. that was the keg for the party. That's the photograph in the book, right, yeah. and Magnus is in the front, in the middle of that yeah, photograph. Yeah. Yes. Yes, so he, he of course was uh, 
was on uh, on Gretel as well yeah. Yeah. In, the, in 62 so and there's only four of the original crew still alive uh, for their 50 reunion 50 right? year reunion. What four that sailed in the wind on the, on the boat? boat. Yes. Is that, there's Mick? There's, there's Mick, yeah. there's Dick Sargent who was yes. his, his forehead hand yeah. with Potty O'Donnell yes. but Potty's gone. Yes. Um, Magnus. Magnus and Terry. And Terry Hammond right yeah. yeah. Mm. So how how do you I mean we, we jump now a bit but how do you see the club and the sport and the, the people in the the modern era? I mean it's a lot different without stating the obvious, isn't it? Well, in the era of uh, the beginning of ocean racing, uh, you sailed in well-founded yachts. Uh, they would look after you under any circumstances. I have a telegram from my father that says hove to in Bass Strait for two days and that was during a Hobart race. Mm. All they had to do was go down below and eat food and talk and yarn mm. and so forth and they were quite safe. Yeah. Today you couldn't do that with these boats, they'd mm. fall apart, they'd, they'd, they'd turn around and you know do all sorts of yeah. cartwheels and so forth. Uh, this is something I, I do think is uh, sort of it's upsetting for the people who have the, the, the well-founded yachts that are ocean um, safe let's say yeah. uh, the, the, uh, to actually go to sea and have to sit on a rail uh, to keep your boat performing mm -hmm. and have mechanical devices on board that are actually powered to trim sails and to work keels and all this sort of thing. It's taken the sport away from the sportsman and to my mind the sportsman is a Corinthian and uh, a Corinthian is very rare even in the international classes. I mean the Dragon Worlds down in Melbourne that Andrew was in, there, I mean he had a Corinthian crew. Yeah. There were not many Corinthian crews but because of that uh, the past late Commodore of the Brighton Yacht Club had put a trophy up for the Corinthian, first Corinthian team. Mm. And I think in the days of the America's Cup, prior to all the advertising and everything, this was the more the norm. Mm. Uh, this is why the Cup is losing international interest mm. and sponsors as well. Mm. Uh, the same with the Hobart race, when Jim Kilroy, he gave up with Kealoa. Mm. I mean, he kept Kealoa mm. as his cruising yacht, mm. Mm. and she was at the Betty, she'd be everywhere. Mm. But he did build another one, but he, gave, he also gave up the racing bed because of that. And I think in the Betty, you've got some of these big. Uh, big yachts over there uh, racing now that, that have those sort of crews yeah. even though they're, they're owned by multi-millionaires uh, because they want to race with people who are compatible with yeah. them yeah. and to find uh, a, a crew that has paid big money to be on a boat uh, it, it, it sort of it's really against the sport I mean it, to my mind, it's if you can't sail a boat with the, by the seat of your pants, mm. you're not sailing. Mm. And Mick and I sail an Etchell, and he's 85 and I'm 77, mm. and we race an Etchell with a young 60-year-old for forehead hand, and we race at Twilights, and still today we can still lead the fleet. Mm. Not every day, but much to the, you know, the amusement of the others, yeah. when we first turned up with Janny Northam as far at hand, uh, yeah. they thought, you know, what's this old guy and his two girls? Uh, but 
it's the fun and it's yeah. camaraderie and you don't get that with the other lot mm. and I think this is it's the camaraderie and this is why this club prospered because we had so much of that in the early days we all pulled together we all had to do things uh, we all had to be on rosters we we you know we we were there the mm. volunteers and mm. volunteers are like that I've yeah. been a volunteer all my life mm. Mm. and uh, my local community said it made me a life member as well well, I was just going to allude to that, that in recognition of your wonderful efforts here, you, uh, a number of years ago, was made a life member here, the CYC, yes, yes. the First Lady Life Member. Yes. So that yes. must have been a wonderful thrill yes. and honour for you and, and yes. great recognition for the service. Yeah. Mm. Yes, well, that was the 40, 40 years uh, since the foundation of the Associates Committee, and it was my 40th year on that committee. I was the only person who had been on the committee for the full 40 years and I had been president three times. Uh, once was with Joe Diamond when his wife would not uh, take it on and the other twice was when the wheels fell off and we had to get it, get it going. But it's, um, uh, it's, well, in, in 2013, it will be the, what, 30 years? 50, 50, 50, 50 uh, 60, 60 years. No, 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 be, I'm 62. It's oh. my, it'll be my 60 sec, uh, 60th uh, year membership next year. Right. In 2000, right. Uh, 2012. But the associates were, were founded in 1963. 63, right. So it'll be their 50, 50 years. years. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so it's, uh, it's quite an achievement and we're one of the very few associate committees still going mm. and mainly my argument to the board and to the club has been that the CYC has never, um, never uh, differentiated uh, between uh, male and female members and Sheila Patrick, who I sailed with, mm. <laughs> But yes, she's one of those. She's yeah. she's one. Of, she's probably the, the most interesting person. Yeah. Uh, she um, uh, she joined in uh, either forty seven or forty eight, and she was the first female member, much to Nina Southfield's uh, horror, horror rather <laughs> rather, because she thought she would be, and uh, that's. Gordon's mother-in-law, yes. yeah, and uh, so it was. It was very interesting. Then the Joe Martin, who was um, uh, Hal Evans' girlfriend, she she was a full member. She had a yacht as well, and uh, there were a number of other ones. Yeah. And it was uh, it was one of those interesting things yeah. as far as the the club is concerned. And the club must remember that uh, they never discriminated. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. Jeanette, thank you very much. You've been yes. a wonderful contributor to the club yeah. and, uh, of course, your late father as well. Thank yeah. you very much. Yeah. Well, my son's still here. Well, <laughs> he's, 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 the, he's the dragon on the hard stand. Right, guys. Right. Wizardry, yes. Yeah, true.